Happy Valentine's Day, or at least close enough to Valentine's Day where I feel like doing a special Valentine's Day video. And keeping with the month of love theme that I started last week, I'm going to be talking about another rom-com. And this being my Valentine's Day episode, I wanted to make it extra special by diving back into the filmography of Nora Ephron. And this movie may be her best work. Sleepless in Seattle. Now, Sleepless in Seattle was written and directed by Nora Ephron, and if you don't know her name, you should. I've got a whole playlist dedicated to Nora Ephron videos because I love her rom-coms. She's probably best known for Sleepless in Seattle, When Harry Met Sally, and You've Got Mail. Those are kind of, in my brain, the Nora Ephron trilogy. If you want just some really smart and insightful and surprisingly balanced when it comes to whether it's for guys or girls, those are the movies that I recommend above all else. And Sleepless in Seattle is kind of a perfect example of that. Because Sleepless in Seattle, for me, feels just as much tailored to a male audience as it does a female audience. And I don't know if I could say that for many other rom-coms because, you know, a lot of them tend to be more female audience oriented. But Sleepless in Seattle in true Nora Ephron fashion is surprisingly balanced. But what is Sleepless in Seattle about? Well, the movie opens up with a very sad and lonely Tom Hanks who just lost his wife. He's a single dad. He's got a eight-year-old kid named Jonah and they're living in Chicago and Chicago is just too much for him. He just sees his dead wife everywhere. So he moves across the country all the way to Seattle where maybe his heart won't ache so much. But then the movie shifts and we're introduced to these other characters living in Baltimore. And it's Meg Ryan who's engaged to Bill Pullman and they're at this Christmas party and it's super awkward and relatable. You know, it's your classic. A significant others never met the family before awkward Christmas party and they announced their engagement at the Christmas party. So you can imagine a good deal of awkward humor ensues because Bill Pullman's character is not the suave confident president that we see in Independence Day. No he is much more awkward and goofy and very just kind of square. And right away you know that Bill Pullman's character Walter really isn't right for Meg Ryan. That Meg Ryan is destined to meet and fall in love with Tom Hanks, even though nothing in the script really alludes to that at this point. But right away, you know Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks are the two biggest names in this movie. They're going to get together. It's just a matter of how long. And the first little taste of their cross-country connection that we get is when Jonah calls into a radio show and talks about how his dad's really sad and needs to talk to somebody. And the radio psychologist, Dr. Marsha Fieldstone, is all too happy to entertain this for probably way too long, longer than any normal radio station would keep one guest on. But throughout this whole thing, Tom Hanks just opens up about how much he loves his wife and misses her. And while the scene is more or less played for laughs that he's not talking to like a real psychologist. I mean, she may be, but she's a radio psychologist, so who knows what her credentials are. I do see this scene as a very crucial moment in Tom Hanks' arc when he finally accepts the death of his wife and kind of starts being ready to move on. I don't think he'd be able to move on and the plot progress the way it does without him opening up on the air like that. But of course, across the country, Annie Meg Ryan's character is driving and she's listening to it on the radio and she's getting really emotional and worked up and empathetic. And it's here where it's really reinforced that, yeah, they are probably gonna end up together at the end of the movie. But they still haven't met each other, haven't even connected in any tangible way. So that's still very much in the future. But now since Tom Hanks opened up on live radio and millions of women across America listen to it, they are all sending him letters. A lot of them actually looking for him in a husband. They think he's a great catch, so they're, you know, putting out the bait. And what may be the funniest thing about this movie is those letters never stop coming. Normally in a comedy like this, you'll get the flood of letters. There'll be some jokes and they'll go through them all, but then they'll just move on to other plot related things but no the letters just keep coming throughout the whole movie they don't really stop it's just wave after wave of letters and Jonah thinks this whole thing is great he's getting all this attention from all these women he really does want a new mom because he feels like he needs a mom is real mom just died so he's going through his own stages of grief throughout this whole movie and it's handled very realistically and very delicately and even though this is ultimately a comedy and a romantic comedy at that the emotions are handled with such finesse where it never feels manipulative it always feels like these are 100 percent genuine people 
going through these things without it feeling contrived or forced. This is a very good example of how to write naturalistic dialogue that feels authentic while at the same time playing within the sandbox of romantic comedy trope. And one of these letters is actually from Annie. She does write a letter to him saying that she would love to meet him on Valentine's Day at the top of the Empire State Building. And if you thought that sounded a lot like an affair to remember, that's because it is. As soon as Annie sends out that letter, we know exactly what kind of trajectory we are on for the rest of the movie. And the movie doesn't really throw many twists or turns. It's very straightforward. You can predict it a mile away. They are going to meet for the first time properly at the top of the Empire State Building on Valentine's Day. There's gonna be a lot of shenanigans getting to that point, but we know ultimately they're gonna get there, they're probably gonna kiss, and they're gonna fall in love, and that'll be the end of the movie. And while I won't say that doesn't happen, the movie does still throw a lot of personality, a lot of charm, and in true Nora Ephron fashion, a lot of movie references to keep you entertained, again, from a guy's perspective. Guys don't really tend to care so much about the emotional weight and the emotional connection between these two people that have never met each other that's starting to form. What the guys are here for is the dialogue coming from Tom Hanks and his friend Victor Garber in this movie. And weirdly enough, Rob Reiner is a pretty funny minor character who's trying to get Tom Hanks back out there, get him dating again. And all these characters keep quoting movies and actors, stuff that film fans or just general male movie audiences would gravitate to. And this seems to be Nora Ephron's thing. In You've Got Mail, there was a lot of Godfather references. And in When Harry Met Sally, there was a lot of Casablanca references. And there's still some Casablanca references here, although it's more in the music, if you know, you know. They reference Gunga Din, The Wizard of Oz, Fatal Attraction, Nightmare on Elm Street, and let's not forget The Dirty Dozen in what has to be the funniest and most male-oriented scene in the whole movie. And it's when Victor Garber and his wife are over at Tom Hanks' house and they're having lunch and they're just talking. And the wife hears about this meetup on Valentine's Day and Affair to Remember and she starts recounting an affair to remember and gets all weepy and just gets so emotional because it's so beautiful. Which, of course, the guys make fun of her for, but then they start crying about how at the end of the Dirty Dozen when they start throwing the hand grenades, it's just so sad. And I remember the first time I saw this movie and that scene came on and I had already seen the Dirty Dozen at that point and I knew this was a rom-com that spoke to me. But as much as I do appreciate a good Dirty Dozen reference, this movie does rely a lot more on being familiar with An Affair to Remember because the climax is basically the same. It's the Empire State Building on Valentine's Day and these two people need to meet up and fall in love. But before we get to that, Annie takes it upon herself to start internet stalking this guy and hiring a private investigator to actually find him and take some pictures so that she knows what he looks like. Is he normal? Is he a criminal? Is he crazy? And when all the information comes back green flags, she actually flies out to Seattle to meet him in person. And she kind of does. I mean, she goes to his house, but he's not home. But then she sees him across the street. He sees her. They're instantly infatuated with each other. They have those eyes. Eyes, those rom-com eyes that say, I'm destined to be your husband someday. But they really don't speak to each other because in a brief moment of conscience, she remembers Walter and she's still planning on marrying him. She hasn't ended things, but he's out on a business trip. They also are going to meet up in New York for Valentine's Day weekend. And when they get there and they're having dinner, she comes clean about all the weird and borderline creepy and stalkerish things that she's been doing with this sleepless in Seattle guy. And he actually takes it like a champ. He bows out out of the wedding graciously, which that is the one thing that these rom-coms always do. They always have the other guy just kind of leave calmly, accept his loss with collected grace and maturity. And I'm just gonna say that is the most far-fetched thing in this entire movie. Not the whole destined to be together, not the idea of reincarnated wives. No, the fact that this guy took the rejection as well as he did, I don't necessarily buy that. Even if you are Bill Pullman, the best movie president ever put to film. Aside from Harrison Ford, but he's a close second. And now we're here, we're on Valentine's Day. She's called off her engagement. She's free to go and pursue Sam. Jonah already took a flight to New York by himself, which I can only imagine Tom Hanks' reaction to that. We don't really see his initial reaction to finding out that Jonah flew by himself, an eight-year-old, from Seattle to New York City. I can only imagine it wasn't a very PG moment. But when he does catch up to Jonah, they have a really beautiful moment where he 
he kind of takes the blame He's like have I been a bad dad have I done this are we past all hope why did you run away and they have a very sweet reconciliation but then after one more near miss with the elevators where you have Tom Hanks going down and Annie going up it looks like all oh, hope is lost they're gonna miss each other again it turns out that Jonah left his bear up on the balcony which Meg Ryan finds and now they have to go all the way back up and oh look they finally met each other. It becomes very clear that she's the one that sent the letter and that she's also the one that he's kind of bumped into a couple times, never really recognized her, never really pursued her, but always caught his attention. He's definitely interested in her. And this meeting at the top of the Empire State Building is such a cathartic moment because whether you know it or not, through the entire runtime of this movie, you are just rooting for these two people to finally come together. Whether they fall in love or not is irrelevant. You just want these two people to meet each other so that for better or worse, the whole thing will be resolved because it just feels like the gravitational pull of them keeps getting closer and closer and closer until finally they meet. And their meeting is actually pretty cute and heartwarming and satisfying and they do fall in love. It's very clear. They just can't stop looking at each other the whole way down the elevator. But in a move of remarkable restraint, I don't think they ever kiss, which means this movie is probably the only rom-com in existence that you will find where the two romantic leads never kiss each other. And I love this movie for that because I feel like if they did kiss, it would be, you know, predictable and oh, of course, because it's a rom-com, they have to end up together and Hollywood tradition dictates that that be sealed with a kiss. But they did just meet each other that day. And the movie makes a big point throughout the runtime that Tom Hanks needs to date people. He doesn't need to rush into a wife. He needs to date people, try them on, see how they fit in his own words. So it'd really feel out of character for him to all of a sudden just rush into a relationship with this woman who he, again, just met under pretty bizarre circumstances. But what's great is that the audience doesn't even need that kiss to happen to make it feel cathartic. Because we already know that these two people are destined for each other. We've seen them interact separately enough where we can put together that yeah they would be a good fit together and then when they do come together nothing happens that contradicts those assumptions but at the same time they don't take it too far they leave the empire state building as two people that just met that seem to hit it off and well we'll see where it goes from there and that is sleepless in seattle probably one of if not the greatest rom-coms ever made it's my personal favorite of all the nora efron movies I probably like this one the best. Maybe it's because it was the first Nora Ephron film I ever watched. But I don't know, I just feel like this is such a well-written and well-balanced rom-com. It's the kind of movie where, of course, women are going to love it. They're going to be gravitated to the romance and the heightened reality of it all, the extreme scenario. But the writing doesn't alienate the male audience either. When it focuses on Meg Ryan's character and what she's going through, it's definitely written from the female perspective. And when it's talking about Tom Hanks and his situation, that's where you really do get an honest reflection of the male perspective. It feels very genuine. And I really do credit Nora Ephron for being able to tap into that as both the writer and director of this film. But now we turn it over to you guys. What do you think about Sleepless in Seattle? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments and if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And as always, I'm Colby. This is my Nerdy Talk, and I'll see you in the next video.